All right. Good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. We are streaming this live as we close out 2019. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just for some time saving. This is Monday, December 30th, the day before the end of a decade, the day before the end of 2019, and the day before epic beginnings of a new decade of 2020. So uh, for fun, we don't do this very often throughout the year, we've got two guest co-host for you lit today. So we've got a couple of guys coming on and we might be talking a little about some high returns and I, I like to make money. So that's always a win <laughs> the real estate market and much more. Uh, but we're going to dig into who these guys are and their impact and where they're trying to go. Uh, but basically we got a couple of entrepreneurs. They might know a little bit about real estate. They might a little bit about how would you guys actually get a little more return on your investments. Uh, so co-founders, presidents, CEOs, et cetera, Jack and Shecky, the high return real estate guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us, Scott. So you guys have a fun, eclectic uh, background as, <laughs> as co-founders. So how did you guys originally get hooked up? Well, I always start this question off because I'm the one who pitched Shecky, um, you know, put the big pitch on him to, to start this, this company with me. So, um, yeah, I was actually, uh, you know, I'm in a, a nutrition multi-level marketing company for the last 20 years, built that up to, you know, pretty, pretty sizable organization. We're hitting over, we have over a hundred locations now and, um, or close to, I can't even keep track of them. And so that, that business has gone great. So I was looking for a way to invest the extra cash flow, and I was in stocks, which that went good for a while, and then until it did it, right? It worked until it did it. <laughs> Are you referring to 2008? Uh, actually, you know, <laughs> surprisingly past that, like more like 13, 14, I don't know, I just picked the wrong stocks, got over aggressive in oil, and then when oil, when oil crashed, um, uh, my stocks, a lot of them went along with it. Hmm. So, and that and a couple short sellers came after a couple companies that I was in as well. And so it was just a, it just a bad like storm, you know, that just happened for me. And I realized, you know, at that point it was, it was a big wake up call to say, you know what, I, I'm not going to just be totally in stocks, riding out these ups and downs for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm only, you know, at that time I was only what, 30, 36, I'm 42 now. So I'm not doing this the rest of my life. No way. This is too much of a roller coaster ride. So that's when I really started studying real estate and, and, you know, looking at the variance factor, uh, it's, you know, stocks are four times more uh, risky in terms of the up and down swings that, that real estate has. Hmm. So I just said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to learn real estate. So I dove in, studied it, started buying up turnkey real estate at the time. That was the, really appealing because I was a, you know, busy business owner, two, two young kids and got great returns. And so I started, you know, getting excited about it. When I get excited and believe in something, I feel like I can pitch it pretty well and sell it. Uh, if I don't believe in something, I'm probably the worst, you know, salesperson ever. So I got, I got behind it and started selling off, you know, a lot of properties. And then with, through the provider that I had originally linked up with. And that's about the time where Shecky was doing digital consulting for me in the nutrition business. I loved his, the, like his style and, you know, the way he showed up, he had a totally different skill set from me, which I'm more like the, what do they call it? Fire and then aim and then get ready. Oh yeah. He's the fire and more, adjust, uh, yeah, a little just later, thing. right? Yeah. <laughs> just let's go. <laughs> and Shecky's much more systematic and uh, much more structured and he's got the digital marketing, you know, background. So I'm like, wow, this could be a really good partnership and we also have the same shared core values you know the way we want to treat other humans <laughs> so we I pit, put the pitch on him and said you know after one of our consulting calls I said Jackie let's let's go 50 50 in this company let's we could create something pretty big and special here and uh, a couple of days later he responded back and said all right I'm in <laughs> so that's how, that's how it got going well I mean now Shecky obviously you guys had already been working together you guys had a pretty much good clue about who each other individually, but was it that easy for you? Or were you a pretty methodical person? Were you still crunching through the numbers and looking at all the details? <laughs> well, kind of. My version of the story is a little bit different than Jack's. But it's, okay, uh, let's hear that, man. No, no, I mean, it's, it's, I just have a different perspective on it. So uh, I was doing digital consulting with him. Uh, I was working under the umbrella of a, another gentleman friend of mine who had a nice digital marketing agency. Mm -hmm. Jack and I had never met in person. 
And uh, we knew each other like through Zoom, like platforms like this. And um, I was certainly a little bit surprised, but when I, when I went back and looked at what I had put out to the universe, it was kind of interesting. So backstory, about six weeks before that fateful consulting call, um, I had a little mini blowout with my then, I wouldn't call it an employer, but the umbrella organization. Mm -hmm. And um, I just said, you know, I really want to go back into truly being in business for myself. So on my little whiteboard in my office, which was in my apartment at the time, I just wrote five or six things that I wanted. You know, I want to sell a high ticket item. I want to be the best in my space. Um, I want to leverage my consultative selling skills. I don't want to work alone. I want to have a partner, blah, blah, blah. Just little left-handed chicken scratching. Hmm. And after the call with Jack, I basically, I was just doing it more as a favor to say, hey, man, you know, like here's all the things you can do. Here's your avatar. Here's the people you might want to advertise to. Here's kind of the structure of how the marketing might look. Here's kind of the, how, the way the company might work as a sales and marketing organization, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. And I just sent him all the bullet points and stuff that we had talked about in an email. And when he wrote back and said, okay, let's do it, I was kind of like, you know, WTF, let's do what? You know, and, <laughs> um, but then he kind of explained what was going on and it, it just made sense. And I, I looked up at my board and I was like, check, 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 check. It's like, well, how the heck do I say no to that? I so, can't. So you send back a, a summary of bullet points or even a guideline, if you will, not a pitch or a cross pitch. And huh. he's like, cool, you get me. Let's do this. And then you're like, wait a minute, what just happened? <laughs> yeah. When he, yeah. When he sent me the email, you know, and we had a great call, like he gave me a ton of great ideas, but when he sent the email back and I looked at it and I said, you know, I'll never be able to implement this on my own. Like I just know me, I know how I'm wired. I'll just continue to keep, you know, selling to friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, and I'll try to run some Facebook ads, you know, I'll take a stab at building maybe a website, but to put the plan in place, which totally made sense of the outline, I'm like, I need help. So yeah. the way I thought of it, I'm like, you know what, I, here's, here's my, I have two roads, right? Two forks in the road of which I can go down. Uh, one road I can go down is just, I can get 100% of the pie myself. So whatever, whatever I sell myself, I'm going to get, I'll capture 100% of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, this, this is going to be a smaller, this is going to be a small pie compared to what is really out there. Or I can go down this path, bring Shecky and split up the company 50-50, which would only be fair, right? To do 50-50, not to sure. be like, oh, I'm 70-30 or whatever. I'd never, I'd never entertain that. So I can have 50% of a much bigger pie if Shecky and I were to align our um, strategies and our, you know, philosophies and everything together. And so... That's exactly what's happened. We're, we're, we're both capturing a bigger piece of the pie because of our integrated efforts. So I'm loving how this show's already starting off because I'm vibing with both of you because I have literally pieces of each of you. So let's, let's pause on that real quick because I think it's fun for the listeners too, is that obviously I'm a sales and marketing machine, yeah. spent years in that as well. Um, but I'm on, the, I'm on more on the techie side. So I actually mm -hmm. prefer nowadays more of the marketing and I do more consulting and brand management. Uh, so I connect with Shecky on that. Yep. Uh, but back to you, Jack, is uh, I, my entrepreneurial bug, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family and wanted nothing to do with it. I chased sure. it. I chased I went from a farm kid to paying my way through college to working my way up in corporations without a degree, all that. I was making more money than my friends coming out of school with their degrees. Yep. And same, same I thought here. that's what I was supposed to do. Yep. Right? This is what you know, air quotes right now, we're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to school, get this amazing piece of paper, yada, yada, yada. So years later, I do all that. And now I'm an entrepreneur and the piece of paper's worth nothing. <laughs> and I, I hate it to be that blunt, it was right? It fun though, right? It is fun. <laughs> yeah. So I sum it up now and I'm like, okay, was it worth it? Yes, it, it yeah. challenged me. It, it, I can prove to people that I'm capable of learning. I have a BS in marketing and psychology. The only thing I still take out of that to this day is the psychology. That's science. The yeah. business, you have to learn, dude. Like me becoming, a, and here's the best part, Jack, connecting to you. I have a network marketing business that I've mm. had for years as well. So, I mean, now granted, I'm not, I didn't crush it in that, but it's still there on the side. It's mm. actually in the health and nutrition space as well. Awesome. Um, and I actually, I give them credit. I tell people all the time, it's like, you know what guys, people underestimate 
some people are freaked out about the MLM world or yeah. the network marketing world, which is the newer terminology we're using nowadays for the legitimate companies. Uh, I tell people all the time, like guys, like it's the, the old ageism of this marketing term. Well, I'll call it a negative marketing term. Uh, Shek, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Is that people are looking at it and saying, oh my God, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's a pyramid. Yeah. I'm like, well, if you actually study the, the laws the IRS put in place, if it was a pyramid, those companies would be shut down and they would go to jail. Sure. <laughs> That's a sure. whole other podcast, but I just think it's funny that we're connecting across all these areas. Uh, and that's why I was, at, when I was reading your, your bios, I was like, this should be interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, my, you know, it's funny you say that because my mom raised me on a farm. My, she, mm. she grew up on a farm in Ohio and that's where 50% of the time she had me teaching me work ethic. Nice. And it was working for my uncle, picking up, clearing off his farmland. He had just bought some acres. I, I cleared off the land for him. And I gave him a, my invoice for 20 hours and he gave me a hundred dollars. And I'm like, Oh, shit. not very scalable. I'm out of here. I'm never working for anybody else again, including the wealthy, you know, entrepreneurial uncle. I'm not doing it. Hmm. I want to, I want to profits are way better than wages. So then, yeah, I went to college right after that. And my, um, you know, to try to get the degree to make my parents proud and like, like you, I mean, I, I wanted the piece of paper just to make them proud, but I had already started building the MLM business. Yeah. So by the time I graduated from college, you know, the, it didn't matter with the marketing degree, psychology minor, <laughs> same thing. Yeah. I, um, I, I didn't, it didn't really have that much value at all, but no. I'm glad I did it. So I wouldn't tell anybody listening, you know, don't go to school. Cause like, it's a great that's, psychological yeah. boost. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I had fun, man. I had a great time, dude. I had some mad good memories. Oh yeah. I mean, so. I, well, yeah. now Shecky, what, what's your what's your uh, floating opinion on the on the modern day uh, collegiate education path? Well, I, I you're think a lifelong it, entrepreneur. Yeah, I mean, you you guys make some good points in terms of you know making a statement that hey, I can finish something or I'm mm. capable of learning or whatever. But you know, it's different than I mean, you guys are both younger than me, but but at your age or even at my age, a college degree meant something different than what it does today. The problem is, is that technology is advancing so fast mm. that aside from not such great uh, educational institutions and the teachers and things like that, there's some good ones, but there's some not so good ones. Technology is advancing so rapidly that the piece of paper becomes obsolete in 18 months. Yeah. So, you know, there, there are bigger companies out there now that are actually not even making a college degree any kind of the minimum requirement. You know, now it's like, well, can you do the job? Yeah. And I, the I, job, I'm excited by that, by the way. No, I'm excited I am too. to hear that. I am too. There's some interesting stats out there about how, you know, we're moving very much more to a freelance economy and, and uh, you know, the percentage of people that are in jobs versus actually having their own business or some micro business, whatever you want to call a freelancer, mm -hmm. things are shifting really, really rapidly. And, you know, your ability to, to do the job is really everything. And most of that is in terms of technology. Well, I mean, nowadays, it's funny because back, back in the day, people were like, oh, well, as soon as you finish your degree, you're almost done. You, you go into an, uh, into an internship. Well, I paid my own way through school. So I was working full time and going, taking classes and accelerated course program as an adult student on nights and weekends. So my schedule was wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I actually can thank that because if I was just all collegiate with not still maintaining my work skill sets, um, I think that is something that's very lacking nowadays. The, they charge way too much for school. The tuition's crazy. And then, and then students who are all in at the, at the, as a student and don't do any work in the actual environments they're trying to end up in, you just, you're going to fall short. I mean, I, I got to have some real life skill sets to apply here. If, you, if you're all books, I don't know, man, I, I wouldn't hire you myself. So. Yeah. No, I think you, that mean you make great points. And, and as Shecky's, you know, said, like, look, the, the amount of disruption that's happening in our economy now over the, in this coming decade that we're about to, as you said, we're two days away from a new decade. And this is going to be a decade of the, the most incredible amount of disruption in the economy and in business and in jobs yeah. that we've that we've seen probably in the last hundred years combined. So for for people to be relying upon a degree a uh, piece of paper that says, okay, I'm a, I'm a expert in this field. I mean, it is just, it's the wrong, it's the wrong set of beliefs in, in today's day and age, maybe 20, 30 years ago, that was fine. But 
It's oh, not yeah. going to hold any. It's not going to hold up anymore. My my old my old friends from high school. We all have high school jobs together. We were from different schools. Everybody was going to Penn State to be an engineer, and I'm like, oh man, maybe I should go that way. Mm-hmm. And and then people like years over the years, my 20s and my 30s. Because Jack, you're not. You're 42. You said. Yeah, I'm yeah, 42 the, in, yeah. in a month. Yeah. So I was. I turned 42 back in September. So we're okay. good. We're the same window. Mm-hmm. Everybody was like, well, you know, Scott, you you can't be the Scott of all trades the rest of your <laughs> life. And I was like. Uh, actually, I love that. That's the yeah. best job title ever because <laughs> I could I could apply and I don't get freaked out by sudden change ups and shifts in the economy or shifts in the in the uh, business sector. Now, granted, I have struggled over the years, and things are doing better now. And these are those lessons I think each of us have to get. And mm-hmm. I think that's why you two coming together here seems to make sense because each of you have your own horror stories. And I think a lot of people who are listening to this whether they're in their forties, fifties, or obviously younger, or we're trying to impact the younger generation. People are afraid to make mistakes. People are afraid to fail. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm intrigued to hear what each of you would come back at something like that, because I think that'll help set the precedence for the rest of this show. I mean, why do people f- are afraid to fail? You guys have come from two different walks of life. You guys are still failing to this day in different ways. What, what yeah. are your opinions on that? Well, I know Shecky has a, probably has a very strong opinion. So let me insert mine. Yeah, right. Let me insert mine first. You know, I think that, um, you know, in school, if you look at how, how we're raised, like all the way through school, you're punished for making mistakes. Right? Mm. So the entire, the entire model is set to where they're, they're trying to cause you to not make mistakes. And as Robert Kiyosaki points out in his Rich Dad Poor Dad book, he said, look, classic. Yeah. He said, you're, your humans, how we learn is making mistakes. So the, you're, you don't learn unless you make a mistake. Mm-hmm. So you don't, you, by getting everything right all the time, what did you really learn and how did you get challenged and how did you grow as a human? So I, I think that that's a big, big part of it is the way the educational system has groomed us to be fearful of making mistakes because then if you've got the parents that you come home and you're like, Hey, you know, look at, look at, I made, you know, I got a C or a D or whatever, like, you know, we're instinctively, we come down on them too. Like get your grades up, you know, just stop making so many mistakes. So I think that's part of it. And then I think the other part is just the, uh, the fear of failure is just so intrinsically wired in us for the last several, you know, thousands of years that it's just, it's hardwired into us. And, you just have to go against the grain, right? I mean, yeah. you have to fight against that human nature of, of, oh man, I just, I don't want to fail. I don't want to look bad. Yeah. Am I allowed to cuss on this show, by the way? Oh, <laughs> uh, you can uh, say all the crazy shit you want. <laughs> no, <laughs> I had <'cause>, nothing. Because <laughs> now we're live on Facebook and, you know, it's like, I, I don't know if Zuck is watching or what. But, yeah, because um, I'm sure Z- Zuck has never sworn. <laughs> never. Yeah. <laughs> No, but when it, I, I'm going to go on record and say when it comes to mistakes, Jack and I have fucked up royally probably yeah. more than any entrepreneurs I have ever met. Yeah, Thank we, you for we, that honesty. Yeah, we've done <laughs> no, that. We, we have. We, we have really have. Really, yeah. I, I mean, I, we often joke around that uh, we, we don't even, not even sure why we're still standing and how we even possibly still have a business. That's some of the <laughs> mistakes we've made. And some of them have been horrendously expensive, like to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. And, um, and yet we're still standing, you know? And, and so I think that by doing that, like Jack said, we've learned a lot and making mistakes and screwing up and correcting course um, really has ironically been the key to our success. And I think that, one of the reasons it's so difficult for people to get that is because we, we live in an era of helicopter parents. Oh, you yes. know, I mean, it's, it's, these kids are brought up to like, everything is made very, very soft for them. We, the, their parents don't want them to experience failure. Um, you look at some of the stories that come out of, you know, the, the parents that are showing up at, at kids, you know, intramural sports and things like that. And, you know, God forbid the, you know, the kid should get tackled. Well, it's football. You're supposed to get tackled. Why'd you put him into that sport? (laughs) Yeah. So there's a lot of really like weird shit going on from, from a parenting standpoint. I'm not sure where it comes from. uh, But I think it is definitely having a, a negative effect in that these kids don't really get to experience what it's like to, fail and how to pick themselves up there's a lot of sheltering 
right? Yeah, that's yeah. a good yeah. word. Yeah. And I think I think I agree with you 100%. I think if, if, if younger generations are hearing this right now, and they will be and watching this, it's like, I'm not we're not trying to criticize the parents here. The, the, the damage is already done. So mm -hmm. if anything, there's a statement I learned actually from a company years ago it was one of our missions or values statements, but it was like, we're all personally and collectively accountable for our results, right? So the key word there is accountability. All right, how are we going to take accountability for what we're going to do moving forward? Stop blaming the past. What yeah. are we doing moving forward, right? So that's, that's another big part of what you're talking about is, yeah, I'm, I've observed the helicopter parents. I know a few. <laughs> I'm like, I know I'm not a parent, but that's not how I was brought up. Uh, my dad let me cut myself by accident, hit myself with a hammer. I mean, I grew up on a farm. I, made, I mean, I, I got thrown from a horse and landed in barbed wire. I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I have all kinds of stories, um, but, but then it's like, okay, well that hurt. Okay. I'll heal. I'll recover. Let's make sure I don't do that again. Right. There's the lesson. <laughs> yeah. But if my parents were there to watch all that and be like, oh no, don't even get on the horse. Well then how was I supposed to learn anything? Right. So, so yep. that was me nuts. So, but so obviously let's take these life lessons learned. You guys, I've screwed up royally <laughs> lost when, well, let's, let's pause on that one point. We kind of skipped over that. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of mistakes. So let's, mm -hmm. let's pause on that. Do you feel that those are, because there's a higher dollar value tied to it, there's a bigger lesson learned? Or it just so happens that that had to be expensive, but you've actually had some more powerful lessons without even a major dollar value assigned, assigned to it. I'm very intrigued on that point. Well, I, I think it's both. I mean, we... Uh originally partnered with the wrong people, but that's, you know, there, there's a there's silver lining in everything, right? So we partnered with the wrong people in terms of providing us with a product. We were originally just a sales and marketing company. Yep. And uh, that proved to be disastrous. Um, this was and, that umbrella thing? Uh, no, this was a, originally, we, we're, in, we're a turnkey real estate provider. So we right. basically provide properties for investors all over the world that you know, live in more expensive areas and whatever. So, so they've, they've got the cash flow and they need you guys to help them do something with it. Source the property, yeah. you know, rehab the property, get it tenanted, get it performing, and then sell it to the investor as a performing asset. So we do all that heavy lifting for them. But when we nice. first started, we were really just bolting on to another company that did that. We were just a sales and marketing arm. Uh, but because we were bolted on to basically pieces of crap that had no ethics, that had a pretty significant impact on, you know, the experience that our early investors and early customers were having. And there was a lot of things that we didn't legally have to take on to fix, but ethically we felt we had to fix. And so there was a lot of things that, that we took money out of our own pockets to make those initial customers slash investors whole. We then moved into obviously doing things ourselves and, partnered with a different property management team and started doing all of our own rehabs or whatever. And we spent the next year and a half getting hosed by a bunch of contractors and people that did not Which have is something we hear of very common, very common. Yeah. And, um, and you know, like, uh, look, well, I'm a sales and marketing guy. You know, how do I know if I'm getting hosed or not? You know, I mean, Jack and I, I think are both, it's a strength and a weakness, but we both tend to be, very positive guys and give people the benefit of the doubt right out of the gate. And, but that has proven to not necessarily be the, <laughs> the greatest strategy. Hey, uh, especially I'm still involved in the with a lawsuit with a guy who destroyed my property and he was the landscape expert. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm with you. That's yeah. So, so it happens. And, and so there's been a whole bunch of things that have happened. And then we partnered with some other guys to do property management and they were just, Horrific. They were helping us with acquisitions and doing property management. And they were like, okay, at the acquisitions. Uh, but they just, they were horrible and at property management. And just, a, I mean, the, I don't even know if I can use the word ethics in their name in the same sentence, you know, like it's just, it's just been a horrific experience. So we went through a very, very nasty divorce with them. And we then learned, you know, the kinds of 
systems and things that we needed to have, have to have in terms of property management so that we and our investors could do really nicely with these properties. We learned all the things we needed to do in terms of rehab and you know, third party inspections and oversight and processes that we'd have to have in place. We learned what was necessary in terms of the kind of relationship we wanted to have with contractors that we were going to have a long term relationship with. We learned, we learned, we learned, we learned, we learned. Right. But, I'm funny, I'm funny, the funny thing is, everybody I talk to about this type of stuff that you're talking about right now, mm -hmm. they all have a very similar story. You almost mm -hmm. have to, you have to go through this to figure out who weed out the good ones from the bad yeah. ones. Unfortunately. Right. In the real estate world in general, I think there's probably more charlatans than there are in most other industries. Um, it's, it's harder, let's just say this, there, there's two main industries that have produced the most millionaires in the United States. Ironically, one is network marketing and the other is real estate, yeah. right? So, you know, we're, we got all the bases covered just in this podcast. <laughs> and, you know, so it's great. And I, and I think that, you know, the network marketing industry in general, because of the personal development and all the other things attached to it, and because of the structure of network marketing, it's hard to be a charlatan in the network marketing world because you're just not going to grow a big organization. Right. In the real estate world, it's easy to hide things and bury things. And it's sometimes easy to take advantage of people that are don't really understand all the big things and all the nuances and things like that. So we just really just lived by a mantra and just said, okay, like from the very beginning, whatever we do, we're just going to do what's best for our investors. It may not necessarily be best for us right now, personally, but in the long run, we're going to bank points, karma, whatever you want to call it. And that ultimately is going to build a really huge successful business with a national presence. And that's what we're doing. I, I like it because there's a key word you threw in here a few times and it totally ties back to earlier in the show with Jack, which you, you threw ethics, you know, ethically, you know, ethical decisions. And Jack, back when you were saying you were considering getting involved with Shecky, you wanted to make sure he aligned with your own, you know, goals, but also your ethics and yeah. what you're looking for and somebody to work with. And it's funny because you guys both joined up for that under that exact same premise, but you still ended up stumbling across and bringing in people that eventually ended up not aligning with that. Um, is there like anything, if you look back on that, I mean, I don't, I don't look at back at things as mistakes. I'm like, okay, well, what could I have done differently to actually see if there was actually a better ethical alignment? Is that stuff you guys have talked about after those, those uh, learning situations? Yeah. You know, I look at, <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, after yep. all the profanity was done and, right. and, and, and money, the lawsuits money, and all that other lawsuit stuff. Yeah. And money, yeah. money was set on fire and, you yeah. know. Yeah. You know, for a uh, partnership to last and, you know, a lot of partnerships don't last. You know, business, business partnerships are, you know, few and far between the last five years or more. Hmm. And you look at marriages. I mean, that's a partnership, right? And how many marriages... How many marriages the, last? The last update I heard was it was actually finally uh, crossing seventy percent uh, on the on initial first time uh, marriage and divorce rates uh, in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I believe it. It's crazy. And why is that? Well, I think if you trace everything back, you know, it's it all comes down to having the same shared core values. So Shecky and I, although we bring different skill sets to the table, we're to two totally different people we have the same shared core values. So like all of the things that we're able to work through all these problems that have assaulted our company and, and be able to be aligned and still be brothers, best friends, you know, we're, we're like, we don't have conf we have conflict, but it's very quickly resolved. Yeah. Okay. So because we're all, we are sharing, we're, we're coming from the same space of core shared values. You know, I look at like my marriage with my wife going on 15 years. We, our marriage has been assaulted multiple times, right? However, we're able to last through it together because we have the same core values. Now, we're different, totally different people. Mm -hmm. I'm the hard driving, competitive, you know, you know, uh, director, and she's the lovable, sweet, kind, you know, we call it the pearl in the personality quadrants. So, yeah, but yeah, because of the same shared values, two totally different personalities, same shared values, we're able to get through, you know, work through conflict and problems. So, you know, that's the thing with the young guys and gals that are listening to this podcast, like you're, it's very important decisions that you're going to make who you partner with in both, you know, in, in marriage and in friendships and in, you know, business, 
And those, those decisions that you make of who you partner with are going to go a long ways towards the success that you have because it's very difficult to have massive success in today's you know economy marketplace doing it on your own as a lone ranger but you need yeah. to have you need to have teams i so, think a lot of people who haven't learned what we're discussing right now is part of what we're discussing is also related to a longer game so meaning mm -hmm. uh, people want everything now we're, 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 a yeah. we're a turnkey society shecky Very you true. said it already man that the education the turnkey technology within 18 months things are obsolete if not yeah. 12 months, especially if you just talk about computer hardware in general, I just spent $1,200 on iPhone 11 pro. Yeah. What's up with that? $1,200 for a phone. Sorry. I just found, I just found out at Christmas cause I have an eight. My, my nine-year-old told me that mine's obsolete now. Oh, and yeah. I just, I just got it. Yeah. No, I, I, also, I never buy the current design, but I was like, well, you know, I could use the latest cameras, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I'll just go ahead and swallow it. I'll use it. It's, you know, it's a business expense, but I'm like, right. I, I've never spent that much on a phone in my life. I was like, yeah. oh my God. But to be fair, back to Shecky's point, right? Technology advancements. Well, it's actually a portable computer. It's yeah. not just a phone. Right. It, it, in the beginning, smartphone technology was it's phones adding in layers of additional technology. Now it's a portable computer that just, oh, we threw a phone on it. Right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> so, I mean, that's pretty much where we're at now. It's crazy. It's impressive. Um, but so it, my thing is this. I, I have words tattooed to my ribs, duty, respect, and integrity. Mm -hmm. So these three words were a, uh, the hotshot creed that I learned. I don't know if you guys know my whole backstory, but I left the corporate space and in 2010, 2011, I served with the federal government as a hotshot wildland firefighter out West. And those two years changed my life. I'm actually finishing a book on that now. And so I can, and all the proceeds from that will go to give back to fallen firefighters and everything else. Awesome. Um, and, but th the lessons learned, the words are tattooed on my body, man, if somebody ever does me wrong on one of those three words, whoo, yeah. <laughs> I, oh, it's, it, it sets me off. Uh, but I like the word. I like the fact you guys went with ethics because it's that's kind of an umbrella, I feel, or at least a feed from those three: duty, respect, and integrity. They all intertwine and relate, and and it's not just in business. Obviously, we're talking about business today and the, that lifestyle. But I, you kind of hinted at it, Jack. Just now, you're like, well, brothers, etc. Like, you guys really come together in a business professional relationship, even if, even as a consulting clients with mine, I have friends that are my clients. Like we're, yeah. we've gotten that close. And mm -hmm. I think what helps with that is that alignment on, on an ethical press, uh, precipice there. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, when I, when I look back at all the problems and look at, you know, deals that went south, or, you know, customers, we didn't, you know, maybe have the best relationship with, you know, business partners that didn't work out, you know, it's, always, always, always a misalignment of ethics. It, 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 that is, it always boils down to just that. So it's like, well, we, we want to do it this way because this is what we believe is the right thing to do, and you don't. Yeah. So we're at a stalemate, and we're not, we're not going to live with a situation where we can't live through our values. So yeah, we're I out. Think, yeah, I think ethics, ethics and values because like a value for Shecky and I, for example, is quick communication. So we get back to each other, each other usually within an hour. Okay. And, and it's never gone past 24 hours ever where he's asked me a question on our, you know, walkie talkie boxer app or <laughs> a text or whatever the case, right. An email, even if I'm in, you know, uh, overseas, I'm going to, I'm going to respond to him within 24 hours. Okay. Now, the partnerships that we've, you know, we have Shecky and I's partnership, and then we partnered with other providers, right? And as he mentioned, and they don't share, they did not share that same communication value. So it's not just ethics, it's ethics and values that need to be aligned. And mm -hmm. so when those weren't aligned, when they wouldn't communicate us and they go dark on us for, you know, a couple of days, a week, whatever, don't answer. That, that just to, to us is a huge red flag. Like, we are in the wrong relationship with you. And this is, we're just not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Well, and, and I, if I could follow those two up, you know, ethics, values, and you already said it, communication. I mean, oh my God, I don't care what business I'm looking at. Every single business at all different levels of all different industries. And I'm not even going to talk about personal relationships and romantic issues, whatever, but it's like communication, simple communication. 
people don't follow up. They don't follow yeah. through. We all under, on this call right now, we all understand sales and marketing. How many sales are lost because people don't keep following up? That's all you got to do. Like yeah. instead of stopping at three follow-ups, go for 12. Yeah. And it might take a year longer, maybe six months, depending on the size or the capacity of the, of the sales cycle that you're in. But it's like, it's one of the biggest things I've learned over the years from my mentors. And I now teach to other people too. I'm like, guys, like, just keep following up. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you know, when someone shows up, I, it's really important to believe them because there were signs with our, our, the latest, you know, property manager partnerships that prior to us forming a relationship to them, we had done some business together and there were signs that they didn't have the same communication values that we had. Hmm. So we should have believed, I should have believed them that time that this is probably the way you're gonna continue to show up should we choose to go into a partnership with each other. It's just yep. like you're dating the girl and believe her when the way she shows up because you put a ring on it, it's probably not gonna be much different you know, over the next decade and beyond. So even if they promise something new and different, right? So yeah, like yeah. I, I have a client right now, we, he's, they got an online vitamin club company and they they have, they launched in the UK and they have a distribution partner over that's supposed to handle all the packaging, shipping, et cetera. Well, there's been major hiccups this year. So I said, listen, it was your first year. Why don't you look at some of the competitors and he flew over there to go look, meet with them and everything else. And he's like, you know, I'm going to give these guys another chance. It's like, Oh, we're going to fix it. Yeah. Just give us another chance. You know, 90 days, we'll prove it to you. And then they were supposed to get back to him after that meeting within 48 hours, no phone calls, yeah. no emails within 48 hours. So it's like, well, I'm going to go ahead and judge by that human behavior, even though their words said one thing that they clearly don't care about your business because yeah. they said verbally that the, the mouth was moving. Yeah. They will follow up with you in 20, 40, 48 hours and nothing has happened electronically yeah. or otherwise. <laughs> my, my parents had a very common expression that they used to use that went like this. The leopard never changes his spots. Classic. Yeah. I haven't heard that one in a while. That's yeah, a it's one. an oldie but a goodie. That's a yeah. very goodie. I think my dad might have used that one on me when I was a kid. Uh, I think, I think, yeah. I think yeah. my mom said that on the farm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let, let's, let's translate that, right? That's what we're talking about here. Certain people, and we kind of go full circle back, going back to schooling and programming and, and parenting or helicopter parents or just – you know, teachers are showing up just to punch a paycheck and not actually, I mean, don't get me wrong. I have friends that are teachers and there's some very passionate teachers I know, but some also I know or have lost the passion and it's become more robotic. So unfortunately, all of that influence is negatively programming people, which is why I go back to why it's so important for us to be lifelong learners and to keep taking accountability for what we need to go, you know, get to go moving forward. I think Shecky, you mentioned that earlier, like, guys, sorry, the learning doesn't stop at the college, but you better keep staying on it yeah. because you're gonna be obsolete in again, 18 months or 12 months or whatever it may be. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up that whole thing because I, uh, Jack, I just sent you this the other day, but I, I watched a, uh, I don't remember if it was a Ted talk or one of these other personal development groups that I'm in, but they were talking about self-esteem and how messed up people's self-esteem is because it's based on what your title is or where you are in life or what you've accomplished and all that other kind of stuff. But it was actually a guy who was loafing on a couch 10 or 15 years ago and didn't even have enough motivation to get up and make a sandwich for his wife when she came home for lunch. And now he's running a billion dollar company. Right. So that's like obviously this huge shift. So what was the thing that caused the shift? He stopped attaching his self image to whatever the title was or whatever he had accomplished in the past or whatever. What he did was he said, I'm going to uh, attach my identity to being the best darn learner that I could be. Mm. So if I'm going to grow a billion dollar company or whatever the heck it is you want to accomplish, then how much can you learn to be the absolute best at that? How do you learn? How do you keep learning? And how do you attach your worth in life, your own self image based on how good of a learner you are? So I, you know, I like, and I, I look at my own experience. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm an old dog. I mean, I'm, I'm hanging around with and doing business with people that are 20 and 30 years younger than me. And, and sometimes dating women that are even younger than that, you know, mom, if you're listening, just close your ears. Um, <laughs> she's not, you know, she's not for sure. She's not, you know, but it, 
I think a lot of the key to my success and feeling good about myself is I, I always wanted to continue learning. I always wanted to learn how to do better and tighten systems and improve things. And, and Jack knows, I mean, I even get annoying with it sometimes in our company. It's like, hey, I know this isn't necessarily the easy way out, but this is the way to build the system so that we can keep replicating things. Mm -hmm. you know, we already learned from these previous mistakes. Let's implement what we've learned. You know, and not keep making the same stupid mistakes, you know, and sometimes we make the same stupid mistakes and you get bonked on the head and go, oh, yeah, this is coming up again. I guess we didn't, guess we didn't learn well, well enough. Sometimes we don't always learn the first time or the right. third time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the so, so I think that that's a, a really, really important value that we should hold in ourselves is our ability to learn. And the other one is the ability to focus, which is extremely difficult in this society because you know you've got so many different things going by you clamoring for your attention you know the facebook feed and the internet and the phones and all the craziness and then just the ability to stop and say hey you know i'm going to focus on this task for an hour uh very few people can do that i struggle with it but it's a it's a really really important skill set what are your thoughts on that jack Oh man, um, I mean, Checky, he's, he's definitely, as far as systems go and procedures and all of that, like he's right. I mean, I often like, cause I'm the fire, then aim and then get ready guy. Like, he, you know, I have to fight against, he has to fight against me sometimes, right? When he's implementing a system that I, even I know it's for our best long-term good, but it's it's also like, very necessary to do it and do it right and do it now to get to get procedures in place so that we can actually scale a company because look at in two different industries that i've been a, be able to build some some pretty cool companies in and systems are pretty much everything in terms of if you want to scale a company beyond a million in sales and really make you know a significant income then there's only one way. You have to you have to systematize every possible part of it. And um, a really good book I'd recommend for I think this will be great for the the next decade and beyond for your listeners. It's called Team of Teams. It's by General McChrystal. And um, just devour. I mean, some of these books you get into them and you can. It takes me six months to go through them. You know, and some of them you're just so good you just devour them in a couple of days. This is one of those devour in a couple days type books and uh, the whole yeah, premise of it bring this up on the screen share for the video watchers the, yeah. this is the guys right here new york yep. times bestseller yep incredible book about how disruption in business and and, and it also what happened in the military they had to throw away a hundred years of systems and programming and beliefs uh, about a, a managerial you know hierarchies and they had to throw all that out the window and totally pivot uh which for for you know a huge military operation in afghanistan fighting al-qaeda was very extremely difficult but they were getting beat right by an enemy that was uh not even not even close to the level of resources that we had because they were they were just able to move so much faster and quicker so right this whole book is about the premise of the way business is going to go over the next decade is that you're going to need to be much more adept at being able to pivot and be able to withstand disruption that's going to happen. Um, so I think that, I mean, for, for, the, for the young people, especially, gosh, I just can't say it enough. Like what, what's about to happen in their lives over the next working careers, the next decade, two decades, you know, it's it's going to be it's going to be an age of massive disruption. That they're going to have to be able to pivot quickly, but they're going to have to be able to do it working inside of you know teams of people that that they're aligned with, and being able to pivot and being able to adjust when things don't go the way you think they're going to go, and oftentimes most of, most of the time they're not. Being able to make that pivot is going to be, and quickly, is going to make make the difference between staying in business and going out. I mean, I've said that for years as well. I mean, if you're not ready to constantly be on the on on standby to embrace the change, people who yep. do not embrace change will yep. fail. Yep. It's and back to your disruption point, and back to Shecky's point earlier in the call here today is like, guys, guess what? There's more technology than ever. Things are moving faster than ever. Mistakes are made faster than ever. Mm -hmm. So actually. 
you guys talked, actually, it's kind of funny, I just said this just now in my head. I'm like, wait a minute, thanks to technology, thanks to disruption, if we can learn to embrace change faster and more effectively, technically, you have less risk to worry about making mistakes because now you're going to be able to make mistakes faster, learn from them faster, and recover faster right. thanks to where we're at today compared to, heck, just 10 years ago. So if anything, people should be making more mistakes as fast as possible right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a good point. And, and then build systems like you guys are doing. Actually, I wanted to do some screen share on your site too. Of course, we're coming towards the end of the call here, but yeah. you got a whole, you've actually documented like exactly how it works, right? So I know you guys are very big on the buzzword of turnkey. That's one of the biggest things behind your brand, high return real estate. So and obviously you guys hinted at on today's call that you've made a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. and risked a lot of money and worked with a lot of people you don't want to work with ever again. So is all of that kind of funneled into you building out your system? Yeah, I mean, in all reality, like we've taken all the costly mistakes, absorbed them ourselves so that we're shielding the investor, the end investor from those kinds of costly mistakes. Hmm. They get to buy, when they buy into our system, they're buying into all the knowledge and all the experience and all the mistakes that we've made the last, you know, four years in this company so that they can buy a product that, you know, has been third party inspected, you know, twice. It's, it's gone through just multiple, multiple checkpoints to ensure quality and the property management team, you know, has been You vetted. warranty your properties? Yeah, they, they get a warranty too, yeah. I don't think I've ever heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Just, we feel so confident in the quality of the product that it's really not a risk on our part. Like we're, you know, we're, we know that things are going to go wrong, but you know, we, we've mitigated the things that can go wrong. This is cool. Yeah. So this yeah, once, once the investor comes in, you know, they're buying a proven cash flowing asset. They don't have to worry about the team that's behind the asset. And that's when you're buying investment, I think the, the, the bigger question you always need to be asking is who's the team behind this investment? Not what is the actual bricks and sticks, but who produced this product that I'm then buying? When well, you buy say, a company stock, you're buying a team that's behind that company. That's what yeah, you're really buying. If, I buy, if I'm a high, high return investor, AKA client of yours, mm -hmm. I buy then something from your portfolio that you guys have already just rocked it out of the park. And then... I basically keep you guys on retainer, right? Like you guys continue doing everything you did great for the property. I just own it now. Is that what it is sometimes? Yeah. I mean, we, you know, our, our latest version, as we, you know, we talked about some issues previously with property management, but obviously there's really two pieces to making a property perform. Obviously the piece one is the whole, you know, buying right and rehabbing, right? It's the actual producing the product. Okay. But, Part, part two is the management of that product. Right. So we have elected to get away from the property management business because we did not have enough economies of scale to do all these cool things that we wanted to do for our investors. So we ended up forming a very, very important strategic alliance with a national property management team. Nice. Uh, they're a very, very high tech company. They're kind of the darling of the VC world. They've written all their own software and they talk about disruption. They're doing some really, really cool things in the property management space, but we have a, you know, a very symbiotic relationship with those people and we meet with them regularly and we have oversight on everything we do for, for our investors. So yes, there, there is a long-term relationship that goes on between us and our investors. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily use the word retainer, but once the relationship is established, they have, you know, good positive experience with us. When they're ready for more, they just come back and buy more. And, you know, what we found is that for most investors, uh, you know, the first purchase is usually just a trial. You know, it's kind of like Jack using Put the, the toe in the water kind of test. Yeah, it's like episode. Jack using the dating analogy earlier. Yeah. Like, all right, you know, we'll go to dinner. We'll see what's up. We'll see how you do. But, you know, I'm not sure that I'm going to necessarily jump into a long-term relationship with you unless we see how, you know, a couple dates go here. So it's a good point because uh, like, the way you guys have everything laid out here, it sounds like it's almost too good to be true because you guys have gone through all these mistakes. Yeah, so. and it's, you know, and, and whereas we do all this protective stuff and, and you know, it's, it's almost like we're got like this giant condom to where we're protecting the investor from, you know, shielding all the problems and things that we've made. However, 
There's no system that's perfect. There's no system that's perfect, right? True. There's still, so you could say like it looks all pretty on the website. Even that prophylactic is no guarantee. So. Correct. Right. That's, that's why I use that term. I know Jack's shaking his head. It's like, oh, Jackie, awesome. what the hell did you just say? That's why I love but, podcasting. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's at the same time, there's still like, there's still risk. I mean, there's still tenants in these places and there's still human beings and there's, there's no way you can accurately predict all human behavior. So really what we're doing is we're in the business of minimizing, not eliminating, but minimizing the amount of risk that, that the investor would have no matter where they live. I like that point. Cause it's almost like, Again, through all the lessons you guys have learned, you can help people mitigate the risk, right? Or in, the, sure. in your word, minimize it. But there is no 100% because you still are dealing with human beings, the tenants, the lease owners, et cetera. You're still dealing with people. They have lives. They have no. variables they're dealing with. You know, unfortunately, people lose jobs, careers. The next thing you know, they're, they're moving out and they still have a lease. All these things happen. So um, now is this stuff you talk about in your podcast too? That's right, ladies and gentlemen. They're also podcast hosts. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two we, one mission. We we'd like to serve the people that are typically looking for buy and hold. I mean, yeah. that's most of the kind of subject. But we've we've got some interesting guests on. We've done stuff, you know, a little bit on the outskirts of that too. And um, you know, you can only talk about you know rental properties so much without starting to repeat yourself over and over and over again. But, um, but yeah, we're, uh, I don't know, 70, 80 episodes in something like that. I think we've got close to 70 that are published Yeah, and it's been, it's been a fantastic experience. Um, you know, you, I'm sure you share in that too, Scott. I mean, it, it's fun, you know, like it's a pain in the ass and there's a lot of production and scheduling and all that other kind of stuff. But when you really get down to the meat of it, you're meeting, you're learning a bunch of cool stuff and you're associating with some really, really cool people that hopefully for the most part do share your ethics and values. Well, and that's what, I mean, so we all would agree on that. That's one thing I, I've been podcasting now for over three and a half years and it started off as a fun hobby because I, I would listen to a lot of really bad shows with people that did not understand that you got to buy a good microphone. Like, okay, you're, you're, you're running an audio program. You might want to sound good. Just throw it out there, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, I've also learned now after three and a half years, this is part of my own, lifelong learning mission uh, not just me being able to pass knowledge on that's what this platform is and yes it's a thankless platform let's be real i mean you're paying money and bandwidth and hosting and i'm hiring you know vas to do the editing because i don't want to deal with it anymore right. graphic design all this stuff and i don't have any paid advertisers or anything i do everything pure and people are like why don't you just take an advertiser on i'm like because i don't want it i can't yeah. stand it i just don't yeah. want to do it that's not who i am i have a business for that i want to make money my business does that so right. It's, it's, it becomes a passion project because it's like this. We get to have, I mean, at least on my show here, you get to have real conversations, say whatever the hell you want. And also our listeners and me get to benefit from getting to understand more about you guys and what it took to get to where you're at and also where you're even going. So it's a lot of transparency. And that's what I love about brand building too, is if you can get more truth and transparency out there in the world, especially in the online space, it helps people get more approachable to you. So I tell people all the time, they usually, like guys like you coming on this show, I'm like, my job, I don't always tell, but I, I want to make sure you guys get some quality exposure. You know, not just, oh, great, I was on a podcast show, but I enjoyed it. I had fun. But also people hearing it like, oh, I actually understand these dudes. I can see and, and relate and connect to them. So I hope you guys got that out of today, at least. Anyway. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we 100% agree. And, you know, we're, we're not taking any corporate sponsors on our show either. And, uh, you know, we very much have the same philosophy that you do. We're just going to go out there, be ourselves, be real. Um, we've done a few shows without guests where it's just me and Jack talking about stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, we like it a lot. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to spend less time on the the daily minutia of running the business and do more podcasts. Yeah, this, but, this, is, the, this is where we get our fulfillment. You know, yeah. success comes from what you get, but uh, fulfillment comes from what you give. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is, we love doing these shows. And if we weren't, as he said, like we're not, we didn't sign up to this business originally to do acquisitions and run rehabs and be construction managers. We, we realized that due to like producing the quality of product that we wanted to stand behind, 
we had no choice, but we had to learn that side of the equation, the supply chain side, and get really, really good at that so that we could, when we're doing our sales and marketing, right, we could really get behind and get excited and about the product because we believe in what we're selling. So I think that's like for in entrepreneurs, you know, like you're looking probably wired, all of us are wired towards supply chain or probably more towards sales and marketing. It is just, you're probably not wired to do both in all reality. So you're going to gear yourself towards one of those sides of the, you know, uh, economics equation, right? But in all reality, you're probably going to have to learn how to do both at some point so that you understand the entire business flow of what you do and, and being able to then know how to replace yourself with an employee that's somebody that could do it better than you. I, I thought you guys brought, did a great job actually hammering that home today. Even back at the very beginning of the show, before we even hit record, you know, we quickly talked about something social media marketing related. Mm -hmm. And Shecky was smart enough to say, you know what? Nope, I got, I got somebody for that. I'm just going to make a note and we're going to hand that off. Yep. And that's something I learned from a great book since you brought up a great book, uh, E-Myth Revisited. Yeah. Right? So part yeah. of that entrepreneurial journey or, or just any kind of company is, okay, you can only wear so many hats. Now, please wear each hat so you understand what's involved to a certain point. And then you realize, okay, I'm ready to hand that hat off now because <laughs> yeah. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. And I'll keep the ones that I actually thrive with and I enjoy. And that's what helps you realize how to delegate and then bring in either employees or outsourcers or consultants or the new thing nowadays is, is the VAs. I have a VA, so I'm looking at getting a second one. Um, but because I'm like, okay, I love the podcast, but I don't want to deal with all the behind the scenes stuff. Let me just hand sure. that stuff off. And yeah. I don't mind paying for that because my time is money. Yep. So, yep. but I've oh, had yeah. to learn that over the years. We feel the same way. Yeah. Well, listen, I've had a blast today, but I, I'm going to ask you guys one more favor. I ask my guest co host to help close the show out. And, and you guys have already rocked the mics strongly. Um, but this is actually an opportunity to leave kind of like an all encompassing message behind. If people forget everything else we already talked about, it's like, all right, you know what? What is a all encompassing message you kind of want to leave behind to listeners, to the world? I don't know, whatever, whatever motivates you to kind of inspire people out there. But is there each of you guys want to leave behind something? Well, I'll go. I, uh, I'm just going to use my one of my favorite quotes is from Wayne Gretzky, famous oh. hockey player. Oh, yeah. You miss 100 percent of the shots that you don't take. I so like that. It, it's kind of like my, and I've learned this from my business partner, who's very much probably more of a go-getter than I am. Uh, just get out there and take your shot, man. Mm. You know, like you're never going to know if you don't. Hmm. I like that. How about you, Jack? I think um, my biggest thing is, you know, like the, John Maxwell already wrote the book. I, I really wish I still had the title available because my entire last you know, 23 years in business has been defined with failing forward. So, you, get, you know, all the young, I know your demographics, like you said, are young. So you guys like that are listening, like you're going to make big mistakes. You're going to fail. You're going to up, come up against things like, you're like, I can't figure this out. I don't know how to, I don't know how to get through it. You're going to just get resourceful. You're going to figure it out, but be okay with, you know, failure is really, it's only permanent if you accept it. So mm. I don't ever, I don't ever really accept it. So you want to just make sure that the mistakes that you do make, don't let them knock you out of the game. If they knock you out of the game, the game over, right? But if, if, if you can withstand it, it's just going to make you that much stronger. Mm. I like that. I like that. Uh, let's go ahead and close the show out. Mm -hmm. Listen, hang tight guys. I want to give you probably goodbye off the air. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the uh, president slash CEO slash co-founders of the High Return Real Estate guys. You, again, we shared the site on the show, but highreturnrealestate.com. Jack Gibson, Jeff Shecky Schechter. Uh, I had a blast today. And uh, make sure you check him out. All this stuff will be linked in the show notes like we always do. Ladies and gentlemen, as we close out 2019 live on Facebook, this will air in 2020. Listen, look forward to a new decade. It's 2020, new beginnings, new mistakes to be made, new lessons to be learned, new reminders to not allow them to knock yourself out of the game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. We definitely did that today. We'll talk to you guys again soon.